on episode 245 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn how to level up your mental game strategy and equipment with Rick Macy, Paul Anacone, and Alan Iverson. Hey there, this is Mirabon. I hope you're doing well and keeping safe and playing a lot of tennis. And today I have a Tennis Summit 2022 preview episode for you. And so as many of you probably know, I've been working the past several months on my sixth annual Tennis Summit. Uh, Last year we got around 12,000 people who registered and watched all the 40 plus sessions from uh, all these amazing coaches that I'm fortunate to bring on to the summit. And yeah, it's it's a really great time. It's This year it is from April 18th to 23rd, and we'll have, uh, similar to last year, two technique days, two strategy days, which are singles and double strategy, and then a mental game day, a fitness day, and some equipment sessions as well. What I did with this episode is I put together previews of three different sessions on the summit. Um, And these ones are chats that I had with Rick Macy, Paul Anacone, and Alan Iverson. And as many of you know, Rick Macy has been one of the, you know, most famous uh, tennis coaches of all time, along with Paul Anacone. Uh, Rick's been in uh, the King Richard movie or, you know, portrayed in it. So I'm sure many of you have seen that and hopefully enjoyed it. And it's definitely been in the news, as you may have heard of a certain slap (laughs) that happened lately. But anyways, uh, and then Paul Anacone is the current coach of Taylor Fritz, and he's coached Roger Federer, Pete Sampras, etc. And Alan Iverson is a Bablet sales representative. Uh, he's it's it's not the famous basketball player that's on the day. Sorry, Alan, I'm sure you've heard that a million times, but these previews are going to touch upon some great points regarding how to become an elite competitor, how to maximize your tennis potential, and how to get the best performance out of your racket. So I really hope you enjoyed these. And if you do, and if you want to check out uh, some amazing um, master classes, um, including on-court presentations, um, video analysis, big time interviews with with some of the best uh, coaches in the world as well, then you'll definitely want to go to tennisfilesummit.com. That's T-E-N-N-I-S-F-I-L-E-S-S-U-M-M-I-T.com. And don't worry, that link is in the show notes. So whatever app or website that you're using to listen to the show, you can just look at it and you'll see the link to Tennis Summit 2022. So definitely join that. It's free to register and watch all of the sessions on there, all 40 plus. All right. So with that, let's head to these awesome clips with Rick Macy, Paul Anacone, and Alan Iverson. And here they are. So I guess, you know, the theme today, as we, we mentioned, is how to become an elite competitor. So I first off, just want to start with asking you, what in your view are the main characteristics of an elite competitor? Well, first off, it's a, it's a great, great question. And I think more parents and more coaches have to focus on this uh, more than anything. You know, I, I really feel, and that's coming from me. And, you know, I, I do a lot of technical stuff and a lot of biomechanical stuff. And, you know, I understand the strategy and the fit, but I know all this stuff's important. It's a, it's a smorgasbord, you know, that everybody has to have to become a great player, but having the ability to compete, you know, and, and then obviously handling the pressure that comes from that, that's the wild card. And a lot of it, believe it or not, starts in the environment that you're in at home. You know, your brothers, your sisters, how you're brought up, your environment. Uh, Not always. You're going to have certain people that have a rough upbringing and you have other people that, you know, people that are entitled and they have money and stuff like that. But I'm just saying, to me, that's been one of the biggest things uh, that I've seen over my career. and, but it, but it cuts both ways. You know, I'm not just saying it's because of Venus and Serena, how they were wired and stuff like that. But then again, you know, Roddick was the youngest of uh, three boys and, 
the older boys always beat him up all the time, you know, and picked on him. So there's a lot of things from the environment, from the mom, the dad, the cat, the dog, you know, just how you grow up, even the school, all this stuff radiates and ripples into your mind, you know, and it, it can change human behavior. It can change how you look at things. And uh, not that you can't learn it, not that it can't come later, but to answer your question, you know, the environment, uh, even the tennis environment, you know, or you got some just country club where you're taking 20 minute breaks or, you know, not that you got to be in the military because it's not one size fits all. So I would say the number one thing would be uh, the environment. Okay. Uh, on and off the court. Number two would be the, the people and maybe even the coach of, of how you're looking at this thing uh, through a positive lens, because it's so easy to start making excuses, blaming other people, you know, getting that bad attitude going, you know, it's just so easy. And, you know, greatness, I tell our people is rare air. We're all good, but greatness is a special fraternity. You know, it's just rare air. And that wiring can start at a young age. You know, how do you look at things? Half full, half empty. You know, it was freezing today outside. When I went on the court, it's 55 and I made it my best friend. Other people couldn't even play tennis. So I flipped it in my mind and that's a choice. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is the people that you're around uh, have a big influence on your mind and, you know, it, it's just hard for people, especially today with social media, what you hear, everything can influence a lot more negativity, in my opinion, than positivity. And you really got to train your mind like a muscle. And so to me, you know, the, the people you're around now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. You might not buy in. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, kids hear, but they don't listen. There's a big difference. You know, that doesn't mean they're going to, but just one, one little thing can change someone. So I think the attitude, you know, of always being positive, uh, you know, I lost, but look at all the good things I did, you know, it's, and being around someone that's like that. And unfortunately, a lot of parents aren't like that. A lot of coaches are not like that. And, you know, it's a long-term process. It's not where you start. It's where you finish, you know, people change, people change. and. Everybody has to understand that. So I would say that would be like those two things would be the most important things in becoming a better competitor. Then as we start to develop anybody, anytime, anywhere, the problem in today, especially with kids today, they're so worried about the rankings, UTR, USTA, where I'm seating what the people are going to say. They're going to post it on Instagram. It's going to be on Twitter. It's going to be on TikTok, whatever, you know, whatever they, and what was the score? What was the score? You know, and you got to be bulletproof. You got to have thick skin. You know, you cannot be afraid to fail. If you want to succeed, you cannot be afraid to lose. If you want to win, listen, Venus Williams lost more matches in three and a half years at the academy than any student I've had in 40 years. I mean, she was playing people better than her most of the time and boys. I'm just saying, if it doesn't kill you, it's going to make you stronger. But we both know if your kid's not winning, like if they lose six times in a month at the, at your academy, they're going to go somewhere else. Like, oh, it has to be the coach's fault. You know, it's always, listen, it's always been my fault, you know? So I get all that. But that's what I don't want. This is what happens now. There's so much trying to protect and you're not developing the one thing. And the most important thing to me is courage. And, you know, I'll go back to Venus again. When people used to see her play, they say, she's not that good. She makes too many errors. You know, because they're probably looking when I had Capriati where the ball was on a string a string, her, her knees were bent in a parking lot, her racket was back right away, where Venus was arms, legs, and hair flying everywhere. And she'd miss a lot, but she had courage. She was going for it, you know? And 
even I would tell her, why are you doing that? She go, well, I think I can make it. And you know, what might be low percentage to even me or you, maybe in a year it will go in the corner and no one will, you know, you got to be real careful with this stuff. So, but there's a fine line between courage and stupidity. You know, we know those players too, you know, they're falling in the bushes and they want to be on sports center with the great shot. So anybody, anytime, anywhere, you know, the kids, you, you can't be afraid. You can learn from hitting against a wall. You can learn more playing someone on your own level or worse. Work on things you might not want to work on, you know, in a match. And then when you get in a match, it's more instinctive. A lesson and practice, it should be learning and breaking it down microscopically. But the problem nowadays, uh, people are just so caught up in the wrong stuff. They don't really develop their game and they're afraid. They're afraid to lose. I'm generalized. But you want to become a better competitor, you can't be afraid to expose yourself. And you can't just say, I want to play people better. That will help you because it will elevate your game. You'll try harder. You might not get as mad. And you hit it in the net against someone better than someone younger. But you're going to learn just as much by playing people at your level and worse. And there's a none better example than myself. I grew up in a small town of 10,000 people. I picked up a racket at 12 years old. No one taught me how to play. I've never had a lesson in my life. I teach more lessons than anybody in the United States today. And by 18, I was number one in Ohio Valley. And no one taught me how to play. Okay, so I would play against people and I beat them 0 and 1, 0 and 0, 1 and 1. And I wanted to go back for more and beat them even worse. And so what it did when I did play people then eventually at my level and above, as I, I kept playing, I never really had any bad loss. You know, I, I never really did. Okay. Because I, I just was so mentally strong uh, about when I played people that maybe I could have lost or pe I never just had any bad losses. So I speak from that experience of me, the way I grew up. So that would be the three things, a leader in the clubhouse to become uh, a better competitor. Thanks, Rick. Uh, amazing information of uh, uh, your environment, the people around you, having courage, uh, a lot, lot of follow-ups for this. Um, first off, you know, with the environment aspect, you did mention, you know, uh, creature comforts like social media and, you know, a lot of uh, kids and uh, even adults are brought up in, you know, uh, very comfortable um, living situations. So if, if we don't have that that environment that introduces uh, hardships to, to help us, um, o, you know, overcome and develop that sort of mindset, I mean, what what things can we do if we're too, too comfortable at home to uh, to 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 help us uh, toughen up? Well, no, uh, another great question, I, but it's tough because the the master puppeteers are the mom and dad, and a lot of them obviously are living through their kids. They're out there. They're out there playing, you know, with every breath and every stroke, you know, they mean well, but they most of the time don't understand, you know, they don't understand why, how can they hit it in the net? How, why are they getting nervous? Why are they choking? You know, they don't understand these things and it's, it's a problem. That's why you need to be around people that have been there, done that, have this expertise. I tell people all the time, I educate the parents as much as I do the kids. You know, I, I really do. You know, it, it, it's it's really important because they're right there with me. But, you know, there's nothing to matter with practicing on your day off. There's nothing to matter with getting up at five o'clock and going out and hitting serve. Everybody wants rainbows, lollipops and sunshine, you know. And, you know, I'll go back to Richard Williams. Rick, we don't want to use new balls. We want old balls. We want them bending and digging them out. I mean, I got it. I'm not saying you have to do that all the time. Um, even playing people, you know, that distract you or people that make bad calls. This is the real world. Unfortunately, everybody's playing defense, defense. You know, they, they want to defend everything, you know, and you can't be that way. You can't pick and choose who you play first round, second round, third round, you know. But unfortunately, a lot of times in training, this is what uh, the coaches and parents do. And but it's, it's a tough sell, especially nowadays, because everybody reacts and they're emotional and you know it's like they're calling balls and strikes every day and it's just not healthy but for me to sit here and say well here's a blueprint how to toughen up your kid 
whatever you do to make them tougher, the message that Rick Macy would give would be consistent. Like I said, you can't yell and scream at them and go crazy and make them run 20 laps around the court, then get in the car and go to the mall, you know, and buy them a thousand dollars worth of clothes. I mean, it makes no sense. You know, it makes no sense. Pick your spot. And so they, so they, they have this tug of war all through the junior Then the kid gets older you know, they get a boyfriend, a girlfriend, driver's license. The, the, the parents burn out more than the kids. The kids go get 17. I'm going to college. And that's it. You know, they, they had these aspirations of Wimbledon at 12. This is what happens. So, but you want your kid to give 100% all the time. You want your kid to run for every ball. You want your kid never to make excuses. Okay. You want your kid to always be on time. I tell people if you're late, you'll never be great. Okay. So, and it's not like, oh, it's six o'clock, I'm done. Oh, it's nine o'clock, I'm done. Hello. You know, you do overtime, good things happen. You know, both you and I, we don't, we don't really have a schedule. You know, I mean, I kind of do, but it, the schedule is like so fluid and flexible. You know, I, like someone asked me, why do you get up every day at 3 30? I say, well, because I want to, not because I have to, I want to. And then I do what I got to do. It's about time management. You know, why do you pick the balls up? Well, I want to. I've never seen the balls just jump off the court back into the basket. So I pick them up, you know, and they go, why didn't someone else? I said, I don't want someone else to do it. I'll pick them up. Maybe I look at it as good exercise. It's all, so this is what I'm saying, but that takes enormous education of parents, you know, but you can't be the other extreme. You can't be Mr. Or Miss Negative, never satisfied. Because unless you got a very unique child, that never works. That will blow up. That will ruin family vacations. That can trigger a divorce. That can just go in so many different directions. Not always. Okay. But as they get older and they can make their own decisions at 18, I uh, just hope it's not game, set, match, and you're out of there. That's what could happen. So, but usually those things never work. You know, you want to, as a young person, their mind's not developed yet. They can't reason. You want to have so much motivation and encouragement that they can, they can do it because kids don't know what they can do. Even maybe I don't know what's in, I don't know what's inside everybody's head, but I have a better idea than probably 99.9% .9 of the world. And I try to find it and I keep knocking on the door till I find what works that day with that student. So there's an art to this. But to really answer your question, um, you know, you can't, there's nothing you can really do to, to toughen them up other than to be consistent about the hard work, you know what I mean, that they're going to do every day, uh, show them videos of people on the pro tour at the highest level. You think you're working hard? You said you played three hours a day. Well, you sat down for 15 minutes and we added all up. That's one hour. So you only played two, uh, the other two, uh, the other 30 minutes, you're picking up balls. We could go on and on. So you only played an hour today, but you're on the court three hours. If we really get into, well, I played all day. Well, wait a minute. If you played all day, that means 24 hours. So don't say you played all day. So I can spin this the other way with all these people. All I'm trying to say is a parent has to be consistent. Um, and they have to love, pressure they have to love pressure that separates great from good no matter if you play high school college pro great is rare error that's a whole different thing and you know you can do a great job but can you do it consistently because if you're there consistently like Djokovic and Nadal Federer Serena you're going to get there and pretty much stay there it's not going to be a cameo where you go in and out so it's even this same mental toughness that you see at the highest level. But obviously what you're talking about with the juniors and kids, it's, it's, it's a wild card because people say all the time, Rick, I don't understand. My daughter has the ATP forehand, ATP backhand. The serve is a hundred times better. They're a better athlete and they just lost two and two. I said, hello, welcome to the real world. That means the other one, you know, was a gamer. They were a fighter. They, they would die to win a point. 
they they had a different attitude. They were always on balance. Uh, they just were there to compete. So they loved pressure better. Say they were looking at the Ferrari on the outside, but the one on the other side, when you lift up the, the hood underneath, they had a different engine, not running engine. They had a just, just, they were just like more competitive. So they handled pressure better. Uh, that done, but you want to have a package as you get older, obviously, if you want to think about pro tennis. So this is what I'm saying um, to everybody, you know, run for every ball, uh, want to play anybody, anytime, anywhere, no excuses. I love pressure, but if your son or daughter is like Vince Vaughn and dodgeball, and they're always like, that never works. That might feel good for the moment. That might be good that night at dinner or your cocktail party and tell your friends. You, you can't hide. You can't hide. And everybody that I had, forget the household names, you know, Venus, Serena, Caprati, Roddick, Sharapova, Mesquina, Pierce, Pennant. Forget those people for a second. The ones that just were some of the best juniors or great college players that maybe they had limitations where these other people had maybe a little bit more of the package I talk about. Maybe they became the best they could be like John Roddick, Andy's brother, just a brutal, brutal, almost like a maniac competitor. The way he, because he was so competitive, he handled pressure better. I mean, he got the finals Australian Open as a junior. And I think, I don't know if he won NCAAs. He got the finals, won at Georgia, uh, coach at USC. Just a, one of the best competitors I ever had. And obviously, Andy was cut from the same cloth. So when you're like that, you handle pressure better. Now, how do you get that? You can't go to Publix or Walgreens and buy it. I've, I've checked. It's not available on any, on aisle four. It's not available. So it's not there. It takes a consistent, day in and day out, you know, effort, and then a balance. I think you got to be humble. I think you got to be appreciative. I think these are other qualities. You can't be like, you know, just cockiness. And you got to have, have the balance and uh, you just don't be afraid to lose. The more your kid loses, you're going to find out more about them, you know, because that's, that's how you, that's how you, that's how a coach, I find more about, about people under stress and under tough situations. And then as a coach, I, I can help them more. Okay. Now, whether they buy in, as you and I know, that's a whole different animal, but that would be my message to, uh, to every parent um, because they think they have the answer because the kid's going to win a tournament and the parents going to think they're going into the hall of fame now because the kid won a tournament. Then the next week they play terribly. You know, so it don't get too high. Don't get too low. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. I can name a hundred people right now that were number one in the nation, 12, 14, 16, 18, and you wouldn't know any of them. And I can name a hundred more that you've heard of and they never won a national tournament. I'm not saying it, it, it hurts or it hurts or help. I'm not saying that, but you keep building, you keep growing. It's not where you start where you finish. Look at Daniel Collins. Look at Isner. I could go on and on and on and on. Even when I worked with Riley Opelka at USTA when he was 14, you know, I thought he'd be 6'6". He's seven feet. They thought he'd be okay. I told everybody, this guy's going to be top 20 in the world. I knew where his serve could go someday. And he was going to be big, but he, he was going to be somewhat nimble. So here we are, not after the fact, Way when it was 12 years old, you know, when I used to help him on a serve and say, put that back foot and like you're stepping on a bug, step on a bug with that back foot. We, when he sees me, we joke around about that. So all I'm saying is even with him, he's the nicest guy, great guy, but underneath that gentle giant, uh, he's becoming even more rougher and tougher. And, uh, I, I think he might get a grand slam once the, the those top three guys kind of get out of there. So, Paul, first off, um, I mean, huge congrats. And you're, you're part of a great team with uh, with American Taylor Fritz, and he did super well, um, obviously, at Indian Wells. I wanted to ask you, what do you think the key to his success uh, was? And, and, you know, he got through a bunch of matches, a couple seven, six in the thirds, and he wasn't playing great tennis. And he's taking a lot more pride in that now. You know, when he was younger, if he wasn't playing perfectly, and wasn't winning easily, I think it hurt him a lot more. Uh, now he feels like his level 
his average level's getting better, and that's gotten him through matches. And then when he got to the semis and finals, he played really well, um, and he was able to free up. So the ability to sustain your confidence when you don't play great, I think that's a trait that great players have. Um, and I think Taylor's building on that. Thanks, Paul. And I mean, what is the key to su- sustaining, you know, that confidence? Is it that do you just have to keep winning or is it um, just, you know, studying some sort of, um, you know, mental game materials and working with coaches? Like, <clears throat> what is the key to that? I think a lot of it is um, just doing all the hard work and all the preparation. And, and when you trust that, you know, you're doing the hard work and the preparation and you start to win matches like that you just grow confidence wise. And I think that's what's happening with Taylor now because he's been working really hard. Um, And one of my biggest coaching cliches um, is really, you you don't practice hard to play perfectly. You practice hard and you practice smart so that no no matter how you play, you react well. And I think that's what Taylor did great on that day. He'll figure it out and he'll create opportunities just because he's done all the hard work and he can think his way through some adversity. So I think those are kind of the key components for him. Gotcha. Thanks, Paul. And um, to kind of bring it back to the club level players, I was wondering, um, so, so once you know who your opponent is, um, what do you suggest the next steps that we should take? Um, You know, I, I think it's really, you know, one of the most important things at every level is knowing your own game It is your ability to understand what you do well and to trust that in big moments. So for the club level players, I would just urge them to do that. Understand what your own game is, understand why and how you're successful. And then when you're playing someone and you know who you're going to play, tweak it to how you plug it into their weaknesses, but don't go crazy. That's about understanding your own game and about knowing what you do well. And then you look at the person on the other side and say, what should I try to exploit? based on um, what I do well. Don't go too far to the other end of the spectrum and try to be a player that you're not. Got it, Paul. And, you know, this may be a, or seem like a really simple question, but I, I still feel like maybe some players, you know, even if they're told to cut to, you know, figure out your own game, what you're good at and what you're not. I mean, they maybe they don't take the step or they still are not sure how to figure that out. So, I mean, what what's like a practical way to go about actually, you know, finding out what is your, what are your strengths in your game and what are your weaknesses? Well, hopefully you have a good coach that can, that can help you and a teacher that's teaching you um, styles and teaching you things in practice um, that maximize what you do well. And by putting yourself in that situation, it then becomes pretty apparent as to how you should play, you know, what your pattern should be. So surround yourself with a good teacher. Um, good coach, good teacher, and make sure that as you're going through um, all your practices, that they make sense to what your strengths are. Got it, Paul. And then just as um, you know, a fun example, I was wondering if you could uh, let us know of like, let's say, you know, Taylor's strengths, um, you don't have to go into his weaknesses, I guess, but, and, and then how he was able to maybe adjust his game against a particular opponent at any of your choosing. Well, look, you know, I think when he played Rublev in the semifinals in Indian Wells, he had a clear plan. He said, you know, Rublev's one of the best ball strikers out there. He'd won 12 or 13 matches in a row, big power baseliner. So I've got to find a way to control the rally early on. So it it actually made it very easy for Taylor to understand what he needed to do. He needed to be aggressive from the first strike, see if he could get Rublev on the defense. So when you get that kind of clarity, and you combine it um, with the confidence that you have uh, and that Taylor had at that point, it's not going to do anything except make life that much easier to play well because there's nothing worse than being uncommitted and unconfident. That's a, that's a double whammy. But if you're committed and you're confident, then even if things don't go well early on, it makes it very easy to buy into some resiliency, and that's what Taylor showed. And I think every player can – learn little ingredients of that um, as they're going through their development. Club players, kids, doesn't really matter. It's the same concept. Got it, Paul. Appreciate that. And, you know, in terms of, um, you know, a lot of us club level players are obviously um, pretty limited um, in what, you know, so we have limitations. And so I guess when we're playing certain players, um, how would you, how would you like go about 
formulating a game plan that allows us to, you know, protect our weaknesses while utilizing our strengths as much as possible. Well, again, I, I go back to what's your strength. You know, know, know your own game. If you're a serve and volleyer and you're really strong at the net, figure out how to get to the net as much as you can. Um, if you're a baseliner and you try to grind people down, try to get yourself in athletic rallies where you're getting your opponent to go side to side and not letting them come forward. So if you do those things, um, you're playing to your strengths. And, you know, it just depends on what style of play you have. But um, I, I don't think it's that complicated. I think players at every level tend to make it overly complicated. Um, power player, like I said, for Taylor, if the ball's, you know, there to hit, you've got to win or lose doing what you do best. And, and it's the same for the club player. If you're, you know, Joe Smith and you're in the semifinals of the club tournament, I'm Joe Smith. I'm really steady. I move really well. I generally grind people down mentally. That means I got to keep the ball deep in the court. I got to keep it side to side so my opponent can't come forward. I'm in really good shape so I can athletically wear them down. Uh, I'm very good mentally so I can make them hit a little ball, uh, a lot of balls to break down their confidence. Um, things like that. But again, everything reverts back to understanding and knowing your own game. And, and then once you define what that is in your mind with your teacher or your coach, then you structure how you play and what you do to, to mirror that. Well, what do you think the, the three biggest um, weaknesses are in club level players, say um, between three Oh to four five level players? I, I, I'd love to hear that from you to, you know, to kind of spark in people's minds what they might need to work on potentially next. And I know everybody's different, but, you know, generally speaking, of course. Yeah. You know, it's like I said, I mean, again, again, it goes back to understanding your own game. Some people want to be something that they aren't and at the pro level too. So one of the biggest things that I've seen at club tennis is they try to hit the ball too hard. You know, everybody wants to serve 140 miles an hour. Well, Everybody can serve 140 miles an hour, but what you can do is learn to hit targets. I mean, you look at someone like um, like Federer serve. When Roger's healthy, he doesn't serve that big, but he hits targets better than almost everybody or anyone that's ever played the game. And because he hits his targets so well, he gets a lot of aces. So he understands how he has to structure his service game. So number one for a club player, um, don't try to overplay. Don't try to overhit. Uh, number two for a club player, See if you can make it as simple as possible to finish points. In other words, a lot of club players try to finish points in a blaze of glory. You want to make it simple. Stick to your cross-court patterns. Find ways to get your opponent deep in the court so you can get inside the baseline. Then it's much easier to finish the point. And when you do that, you're playing high percentage tennis, which means you're probably going to make a lot fewer uh, unforced errors. And that's the, that's the simple way to do it. So. Good shot selection. Uh, don't hit the ball so hard. Um, making sure that whenever your points are finished, try to evaluate yourself on whether or not you played the point the right way, not whether or not you won the point. Because there's a lot of times where players will win a point and they win it the wrong way and they do it over and over again. Then all of a sudden pressure comes and they can't play that way because it's not really their style. So always talk to yourself about was at the right kind of point that I do what I do best that I set up the scenario the way I want to. So those would be the key ingredients in my book. Yeah. I love that Paul, just being process based and, you know, if, if you do everything correctly and then you're just unable to execute, you know, sometimes that's going to happen and we're it not happens. machines, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Um, Paul, another question that I get a lot is um, what if, if you were to have club level players focus on, one aspect, um, you know, between strategy, fitness, mental game, and strat, uh, what did I say? Technique, strategy, fitness, and mental game. And let's assume that this three O player wants to get to a four or five level or above. Um, is there one of these areas that you think is most important for them to focus on? I, I look, I think there's a big difference between learning to hit a ball and learning to play, you know, there's a lot of people, I love playing golf. There's a lot of people that hit the ball great on the driving range, but can't play. You know, there's a lot of people that, you know, are great doing drills on the court with their coach hitting a million balls, but don't play matches very well. So for me, what that means is I would work on the mental component of it. Am I strategizing and structuring the points the right way? 
How resilient can I be when I'm not playing great? That mental stuff, no matter what level you're at, will be the driver to push you forward. So mentally, can you come up with a, a recipe that stands up under pressure? Can you think under pressure? Can you analyze pragmatically in the middle of a match without getting really emotional? That's hard to do, but the best can do it in the most difficult times. And there's no reason club players can't get better at it at their level as well. Mm, there are a lot of interesting, um, you know, follow-ups that, well, in my opinion that I have, um, you mentioned, um, being able to analyze, um, you know, under pressure, uh, how do we, um, how do we improve upon doing that? Cause I know that's, that's tough, as you mentioned for a lot of players. I think the biggest thing is, like I said earlier, is you have to be evaluate, you have to be able to evaluate, not what just happened that you won or lost, but did it happen the right way? You know, if I'm a baseliner, and I just lost eight points in a row at the net, that's probably not a great you know, theme that's going on for me. So most people get tied up in the emotion of what's going on on the scoreboard, and they're unable to go, okay, did I structure the point the right way? Did I win or lose that point doing what I do best? So you have to circle back and keep asking yourself these hard questions, which sounds really easy, except under pressure, it's not easy because the emotion drives it. And that's why you have to be able to use the emotion as a passion driver, but not a negative basher and make sure that you don't beat yourself down. And that makes you paralyzed and unable to think your way through situations that are pretty challenging on a tennis court. Well, so that, that last um, bit that you mentioned, I mean, uh, can you tell me more about how we, uh, how we can transfer, you know, that emotion into um, positive versus negative? Is it simply like Rick Macy uh, calls it flipping a switch or is there, some other more deep nuanced um, steps that we can take to that we need to take to, to transform it positively instead of negatively. Sure. You know, that, that's the biggest challenge, right? There's been so many debates and a lot of studies about it. And look, I, I think you become a product of your environment. I think things become habit forming. And, you know, you look at someone like Rafa Nadal, how's he able to be this singularly driven? And, and, and Rafa plays every point like it's the last point of his life. And to us, that seems incredible, but he's been doing that since he was 10 years old. So it's just normal to him. It's just natural because he created so many good habits. He doesn't know anything else other than making sure all he does is try to figure out how to do what he does best in the big moments. How do I survive this moment? So for me, it's about creating those good habits. How disciplined in practice? You know, one of my first coaches told me, Never make two unforced errors in a row and see if you can see if you can limit the amount that you do that. And I was a little kid when that happened. But I tell you what, when I started thinking about it and I was like, okay, I just missed a ball. I'm not going to miss a ball the next point. You, know, you, you just start to ingrain habits that promote the ability to just hit a switch like you talked about. And that switch um, kind of through the years of repetition becomes just natural. It's just automatic. You create that by doing it every day, every day, every day, every day. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you might not be Rafa Nadal, but you're going to compete like him at your level. You're just going to try every point. That's all that matters is try, 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 figure it out, figure it out. But that's all that matters. That's how he evaluates everything. Sure, he wants to play perfectly, but he does such a great job of accepting whatever it is on the day. And that's out of practice habit. And then I think everybody can do that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks, Paul. I'm curious, you know, I, I love that um, part where you mentioned that, you know, your coach had told you to, to never, um, you know, uh, lose two points in a row via um, an error. Um, but were, were there ever times when maybe you, you did, you know, lose two points in a row due to errors? And then uh, I'm curious, like, how, how did you react to that? Were you, you know, were you, pretty hard on yourself or were sure. you just like, it's yeah, okay, look, next one or, okay. Yeah, no, look, every, everybody does that. You go through spells where you have bad days, but, you know, I think it's really important to be able to sit back and go, okay, what happened today? And it, it doesn't mean that you're always going to have these perfect days. What it means is you're going to have a really clear way of trying to evaluate things as they happen. And so when I, when I did it, I would just try to evaluate, see what happened. And then next time I go on the court, you do it less. And then the next time you do it, le you know, it's a progression. So everybody wants to progress um, in the right direction. And the only way you can do that is to be really transparent with yourself. 
you know, you have to be able to be re responsible and accountable. If you're not, and you live in a fantasy land where you're always blaming others, you're not going to get the best out of yourself. You have to be able to just accept sometimes you make mistakes. Sometimes stuff happens. That's life. Now, what do I do? How do I get better? How do I learn from it? And, and again, um, I think everybody goes through it every day. And I think that's why the all time greats that are still playing are still playing because they're still trying to get better. They love the fact um, that they're out there doing something that they love. They love to compete for sure, but they love tennis and they know that it's not a game of perfect. Perfect is what you have on the day. Perfect isn't something that you're going to have all the time. Perfect is what's right in front of your face and how you manage it. That's what perfect is. Unfortunately, most people think perfect is never missing. Not, no, it's not. That's not perfect. Perfect is trying to figure stuff out. How does Nadal come back from two sets to love in the finals of the Australian Open this year? He had no right to come back from two sets to love. He's down break points to go down 4-2 or 4-3 in the third. But the only reason that he did is because he just played every point. Did he play perfectly? No, but he reacted as close to perfect as you can to try to figure it out. And then that gives you a chance to excel. So I think people have to continually test themselves and see if they can reframe kind of the landscape they live in. Um, so our, our theme today is how to get the best performance out of your racket. So um, I usually approach these questions by, you know, breaking it down before I ask like the big question, but I'll just ask you right off the bat. I mean, it, in general terms, I guess, um, how do you get the best performance out of your racket? You really want to think of it in three ways. There's three components, three major components to your racket. So there's the racket itself that's produced, that's your chassis to get the performance. Then there's your, your strings, that's the motor. And then there's your grip choice, which is the type of grip also, but also the grip size. All that makes a huge difference. And there's been some big changes in some many more choices in head sizes and string and grips than there ever used to be. So that's what makes all this very customizable to what you like. Yeah, and it seems like it's just such a minefield in regards to, I mean, you know, we all love choices, but at some point it just becomes like <laughs> there's so many and we need guidance, which is the whole reason why we, we have you on, Alan. So, uh, I mean, how do you navigate that, you know, the, all the choices and how do you pick the right, um, you know, specs on each of these different categories that you mentioned? Well, I mean, the problem with the way tennis product is marketed is kind of like nutrition, right? I mean, everyone has this secret diet that's going to change things for you, but it's all about talking about advantage drawback. And that's the best way to understand things because you're figuring out the best thing for you. What, what your young teaching pro likes, what you like could be totally different things. Because at the end of the day, this is personal. Tennis is a great sport because it's personal. And you got to find it. This is your hand at the end of the day. And so you're always working to find that best level. I mean, even Nadal just switched. He was in a 15 gauge, which is a very thick string, to a little thinner version and 16 gauge to get a little more a little more power out of his string, a little bit more string movement, but a little less control and durability. That's the trade-off. So even the pros are fine-tuning what they do. Some guys stay very consistent. Other guys will vary what they do according to the condition. Yeah, that's a great point, Alan, because, uh, you know, basically um, it sounds like we should not just set it and forget it, so to speak. We should pay attention to you know, how we're evolving, how our game's evolving, our, our physicality is evolving and so forth. And, um, you know, tweak and fine tune as needed. Um, but so in terms of the racket, um, which obviously is one of the biggest parts here, um, what advice do you have in terms of, um, I guess, well, first off, like what types of rackets are out there and then how should we, um, go about categorizing and then, and then picking the right one? When you think about rackets, rackets break down, you know, the power level depends on a few things. The head size, the beam width, right, and the length. So let me, let me show an example here. So this would be, it's a little harder to see here, but this is a Bob Lock Pure Drive 107. So 107, 
stands for how big the surface is. So way back in the day, you had smaller rackets that were called midsize that were 85 to 90 square inches. So if I get a smaller head, I get more maneuverability, more control, but less power. A bigger head like this gives me bigger, bigger power. It's actually more stable at impact, but it's harder to move. That's why a lot of your oversized rackets are bigger head size in longer to create more power, but they're lighter. So you, you make up some of, for some of your maneuverability loss. Where the smaller heads, they can make those rackets heavier to get some of the power back and some of the stability. What's happened is before you only had mid or the 110 oversizes, Baba came out with more of a mid size, which you know, right? When you see Roth applying with this racket, this is the arrow, this is a 100 square inch racket. So that's a blend of power and control that people like. So head size is one, length is one. Typically, you can get some of these mid sizes and longer length. Most of your bigger servers use an extended racket. So that goes back to Gordon. He's Ivinovich, Michael Chang at the end of his career used it, Leighton, he Leighton Hewitt, Nabandian, you know, current guys are like Sam Query, Songa. You know, they like the longer rackets because it's more power on serves and ground strokes, but less maneuverability. That's your trade off. So that's what you have in the arrow. You also see in the beam width, that's a thicker beam compared to something like this. This is a new racket for us called the Pure Strike 97, 97 quarter square inches. That's a thinner beam, right? And then as you get into the frame, how rounded it is, they call it elliptical, will create, this is the beam width in shape. So a, a squared off beam, which was traditional, create a lot of feel, a lot of flex, but not much power. This is along those lines, more of a squared beam. You're gonna get a lot of feel and control, but not a lot of response. This is a little thicker than it looks. Sorry for the video, it's not really showing it as well as I'd like but this comes to a tip like an airplane wing. That will cut the air faster, but also makes it more maneuverable. So more power, more power. So thicker here, stiffer here because the elliptical, it moves to the air faster. That's the reason why vibration dampers have gotten more popular because this is hollow and it makes a noise. I put a vibration damper on it, it changes that sound, but it doesn't reduce vibration to your arm. It's changing the sound of the racket not vibration to your arm. Arm issues are gonna be more around the stringing. So that's kind of the basic things about that. It's tricky now because in rackets, you can get a 90, 95. This model I'm showing you is a 97. We just went to a pure strike, which is a thinner beam racket and a 103, which is for maybe a, a player who wants more control, but wants a little more room. So you're understanding what you like there. What also goes with this is weight. So as I add weight, I get more power, but I get less maneuverability. Typically your smaller heads are, you know, are heavier. You had some players models that came out that did very well initially because they work great for that player, but it was a pro spec and people couldn't swing it. They hurt their arms because they, you know, if I swing, if I have every racket and I'm late, I'm hurting my arm. So you're trying to find the right weight for your swing. So a racket like this or the pure drive, we make it in four weights. So you're finding your weight for your swing. You know, understand my understanding on racket, how rackets are made, came with Bob Lott teaching me from what they learned by swinging for the Pro Tour for 20 years. And that was not as easy as you think because a pro knows what they like but not necessarily why, because it's all feel for them. They're good because they don't have to think about it. They just find the right feel and they hit it without thinking. So match point, they're hitting their shot without having to think about it because, well, they're a pro. So find the right weight, find the right head size. That's what you're finding. You're finding those elements that you like together. Really? Next, no, so I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Next, you get into string pattern which, you know, Bob Lott introduced a more open pattern. So the, the less strings I have, the more power I get because 
These strings elongate better and I get more spin, but I get less durability and control. In the US, these more open patterns are more popular. Players like us who are who we have from the, the European side, like a dominant team, will prefer a more dense pattern for control. So that looks something like this. See how the strings are closer together? That gives me more control, better tension maintenance, and longer life uh, to, the, to the string job because there's more strings work. That's the trade-off. In fact, strings got really open with some manufacturers, but they found that uh, people were breaking strings too much and they had to go to a very stiff string just to keep durability. There's a lot of different factors there. Really excited to uh, follow up with some questions here. So first off, um, should all beginner players generally go, you know, 100 square inches plus on their rackets, you know, 104, 107-ish? Or are there some, you know, exceptions? Like, what are your thoughts on that? A lot of it depends on swing speed. So, and some of that is athletic background. So you have a... a, a a former baseball player or someone who's done a lot of athletics who swings fast, they might have a different knee, you know, so it's going to depend on your swing speed. You know, the bigger head size is going to give you more room, but less control if you swing fast. So 100 square inches on up is typically what most people like, you know, 98 on down is more for control, but it depends a lot around what you like swing speed wise. So if you're a fast swinger, you might prefer a, a, a smaller head size in a thinner beam width. Mm, gotcha. Thanks, Alan. And then in terms of the, um, you know, the plus uh, versions versus the regular um, length rackets, I, I know you described uh, what characteristics they have. Um, you know, you have more power and, and people with big serves tend to use um, plus size rackets. But what what types of players do you think should versus should not use a plus like i don't know you, you mentioned maneuverability so i i mean should somebody who comes to the net a lot like should they be wary or somebody who gets jammed a lot should they be wary like what are your thoughts on the types of players who should get plus size rackets versus not so when we talk about plus size rackets typically they're a half inch to an inch longer and there's some variation for people who do three quarter inch or quarter inch like our 107 is a quarter inch because it's actually a little heavier. It's about 9.9, whereas our, the, the 110 that we make is even lighter, and it's a half inch longer because this is at 9.2. It's a bigger head size. You know, there's a little bit of a sheen to it. But a lot in its model lines makes all the colors look similar, and there's some slight differences, and then we write that, that what kind of model it is on the racket. Um, you know, plus is typically or someone who's looking for power on serve. That's the biggest deal. So all your bigger servers, so if you're looking for a little help there, that's great. Power on ground strokes the same. So if you're looking for some help on your serve and you've got the ground strokes to still swing it, to hit the ground strokes, that's what you want to do. I mean, I use the plus. I like it because I like the extra help. But that being said is, we sell it well, but not nearly as well as the standard length, which is easier to control. Gotcha, gotcha. And sorry, the reason why we get more power is, is what does the length do for us again? It's a longer lever. So the, the longer lever you have, the more power you get. And the funny thing is, um, you know, we had a connected racket, which was a computerized racket, was showing us where we could hit on the racket. And what we found is with all the data we was getting from this rack is it could tell you where you're hitting on the surface is that the pro players for their serves and for tossman shots hit here. Flat to slice shots are hit more in the middle of the racket. They're hitting here because that's more power. That's literally longer away. And if you look at what's changed technically, you know, back in the day, we were taught to hit kind of bent elbow close. If you watch all the players now, they're extending further away from their body. It's a longer lever, more power. Who doesn't want gotcha. more power, right? We're Americans. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. It's, it's only if I'm hitting long a lot that I don't want that, that power as much. Um, and then, you know, to dig in a bit more on the, um, the beam type, uh, you know, the, the, the beam that I use, I use like a 2017 um, Pure Aero VS, which I really enjoy. 
Um, and I know there's been an updated version with a different type of beam. So, uh, and I think the one that I use is a little more squared off, but, uh, what, what type of beams would you suggest for what types of players? So beam with, so what you were using was kind of a unique blend because it's a square head with a slightly denser pattern. So 16 by 20, most open patterns are considered 16 by 19. And dense patterns are 18 by 20. Yours is a 1620. The new version of what you have looks more like this. We used to do two weights in it, but the pure arrow VS was an interesting model. And Bomblot for years had trouble really categorizing it because it was, we made you know the, our red or red and white line is our most, most controlled line. Now it's called pure strike, but it's a it's a square beam or what they call hybrid, which is where it's flat, but also rounded. So it's a blend of the two. Yours has the arrow throat, which is elliptical for power, but a square head, which is what's on this. So it's a unique blend and, you know, it's been very popular. We still have guys on the tour using it now. Uh, Jack Sock being one of them. Felix, uh, you know, Felix Algerazim uses it also. Um, we've done some thinner beam elliptical rackets, which now you see with Carlos Alcaraz. Mm -hmm. So that's this racket. You know, in the VS line, we kind of denote it with this kind of special tinting to it. That's a thinner beam arrow. So it's a smaller head, same pattern, thinner beam in 98, little softer layup. And that's the tricky thing with rackets is we can talk about a racket and even racket stiffness. And we're talking about how stiff it is at the throat. Well, there's 14 flex points on a racket. And the, the manufacturer is not going to tell you where those all are at. Even when I ask, and I love to ask technical questions on rackets, it's like a good cook tells you kind of, but not all the recipe, you know what I'm saying? So even our, the latest pure dry was a huge improvement for us, not just because we doubled up on vibration dampening, but they changed the layout of the racket and made it more controllable. And, you know, it, it's just flying off the shelves. It was a great selling seller for anyway, but now it's even more controllable. But that's where you, you know, a thinner beam here, smaller head, what you have is a very unique model because it was a blend of the new and the old. All right. I really hope that you enjoyed these Tennis Summit 2022 preview clips with Rick Macy, Paul Ancone, and Alan Iverson. And if you did, and if you want to check out all 40 plus um, master classes on technique, strategy, fitness, and the mental game from the best coaches in the world, then definitely check out Tennis Summit 2022 by going to tennisfilesummit.com. That's T E N N I S F I L E S S U M M I T.com. And of course, check the show notes page so that you can easily click on that link without having to type it out in full. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for listening. I really appreciate it. And definitely join me at Tennis Summit 2022. We're also going to do a bunch of live streams where you can ask us um, all your questions and it'll be really fun and interactive as well. And you can even win prizes that were given out um, from Babolat and other cool brands. So, all right, with that, um, I do want to leave you with a quote as I often do at the end of the show. And this one is by Shiv Kara. And Shiv said, your positive action combined with positive thinking results in success. So that is a great one. And of course, leave a review for the show if you so are inclined and if you enjoy it. But most of all, definitely want to see you at Tennis Summit 2022. So click that link in the show notes page or on the show notes page. All right. Have a great one. And I'll see you next week on the Tennis Files podcast. Take care. Thank you.